I am uh, equally excited to introduce our speaker today, um, Pastor Dr. Crawford Lourdes and his wife Karen. They presently serve uh, at Fellowship Bible Church in Waswell, Georgia. And so uh, they have been there for a while, but he has written nine books. The most recent one that he wrote with his wife is Your Marriage Today and Tomorrow. He has five doctorate degrees. You heard me write five. Uh, Dr. Gree, so I've got some work to do to catch up, but uh, he's been a featured speaker around the world, including uh, major events like the Super Bowl. Uh, he has spoken for the Pentagon. He's currently serving on the board of Chick-fil-A. Uh, this is a man who is well-connected and well-respected literally around the world. They have four adult children, Brian, Heather, Brendan, and Holly, and they have 11 grandchildren. And so it is genuinely an honor for us today to welcome Pastor Crawford Lourdes to the stage. Well, let me straighten out something real quickly. He said five doctorates. Most of those are honorary, or else I would have been in college until I was 97 and a half. So uh, good to see you. Good to be here with you. I'm actually traveling with Joel Diaz, who is an alum here at uh, Lee, and uh, yeah, give it up for Joel, and uh, he's our Connections pastor and a great, great guy. Let me get something out of the way real quickly. Uh, how many of you are sleepy? Just raise your hand. Be honest. Be honest. All right. Well, here's the deal. If you are sleepy, please go ahead and go to sleep. All right? I, I can see far more than you think I can see up here, and uh, I've slept on the best of them, so what goes around comes around. So just, just go ahead and go to sleep. Don't fight it. Don't fight it. It's ugly when you fight it. So just, just, just go, go to sleep. Go to sleep. You'll get a tape or write me. I'll give you the outline or whatever. But by all means, don't do one of these two things. Don't do like this. That's distracting. Just sleep. And, uh, and by all means, don't do like this, pretending as if you're reading or praying. Now we got character issues. That's lying. So just go ahead and go, ahead and go to sleep. Go ahead and go to sleep. <laughs> I struggled a little bit about what, what to share with you today because uh, y'all don't know me from Adam's house, Cat, and I don't know y'all. And, uh, and I just uh, wrestled a little bit, but I... I decided to share, as I prayed, I, I really felt led to share something on, on encouragement, on encouragement. Um, and let me just set it up this way. I want to differentiate between three words uh, that sometimes we get a little sloppy and use them interchangeably, but they're significantly different. Disappointment, discouragement, and depression. They're three different words. Uh, they have three different meanings. Disappointment doesn't mean that you're discouraged. It just means that an expectation has not been met. You're just disappointed. I mean, that happens every day. Every day of your life, you're going to be disappointed. Somebody didn't show up, didn't, re didn't return the call, didn't answer your text, didn't answer your email. This didn't happen or whatever. That's just, that's just the garden variety of life. Uh, disappointment means you don't control anything. <laughs> you know, you just get disappointed. Uh, now, let me skip over discouragement. I want to come back to that one. So, let me jump to the third word. Depression is, is something different. I, uh, depression means the loss of hope. It means that you, you sunk beneath the hope line. The darkness has closed in on you, and it's a, it's, it's a dangerous place to be. And if any of you are struggling with that, uh, you got to do what you don't feel like doing, and that is you've got to rush to get some help. Uh, to get back over the hope line. Now, uh, that's a little bit above our pay grade today, so I'm not going to talk about that, but I do want to talk about discouragement. We all get discouragement. Discouragement is different from disappointment. Discouragement means what the word implies. The wind's been knocked out of you. You go, oh boy, why does that keep happening? And you can have a series of disappointment that will Put you over in the discouragement side. It doesn't mean that you're depressed, but it means that it's a little bit of a struggle to keep moving forward. And some of you are faced with that right now. I mean, some of you, particularly if this is your first year here, you're away from home, and you know, by this this uh, 
the beginning of, of this semester right now, all the, as the parties have ended and all the excitement about being on campus and the reality that you got to wash and iron your own clothes and pay your, and all these other kind of things, and you got stuff that you need to do, and you're thinking, I didn't sign up for all of this, but yes, you did, and uh, <laughs> you are here, and so now you're going, oh, man, I got to show up, I got to do all this stuff. We all get discouraged. But specifically, what I want to talk about today is how not to be branded by discouragement. How do you stay encouraged? I, 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 I probably shouldn't say that word because nobody ever stays encouraged. And discouragement is a part of life. There are going to be plenty of times in which the wind will be flat out knocked out of you. That's just part of life. But how do you not be branded by discouragement? You know what I mean by that? How, how, do you, how, do you, how do you not be marked by it? Have you ever met people who are consistently negative? That's not a good place to be. How do you, how do you not be branded by the south side of life? Uh, just the pain to be around. Uh, everything is wrong. How, how, do you, how, do you, how do you not do that? Now, I'm going to say some things that are kind of intuitive to us. Um, the overarching thing that I want to say is that your, your mental condition to a large degree is a product of your choices and not your circumstances. Did you hear what I just said? That your mental state, your emotional state is largely the product of your choices and not necessarily your circumstances. Your emotions, your feelings, they are great passengers, but they're poor drivers. And you've got to get to a place in your life where, I didn't say that your emotions were wrong, they're real. I didn't say that they're not powerful, they are. I don't, I, and you ought to pay attention to them, but they should not determine your life. If they do, then you will be on one erratic hell ride for the rest of your life. So the issue has to do with what choices am I making? What decisions am I making? What's determining the direction of my life and what's determining my outlook? So the decisions and choices we make when we are discouraged will determine whether we will have a healthy mindset or if we will become imprisoned to darkness and gloom. So I want to suggest to you five critical choices that when discouragement comes knocking on your door, and it will visit all of us, we don't live in heaven and board down here, it's going to happen, Jack. It's just a reality. That is life. I don't want it. Well, there's a lot of things happen to you don't want, but it's going to happen. So what do I do? What do I do when it comes? What do I do? I want to suggest these fundamental five critical but obvious choices. The very first thing you have to do when discouragement comes visiting you, you have to choose, hear me on this, you have to choose truth. You have to choose truth. Normally with discouragement, it's kissing cousin is distortion. Reality gets distorted. And before you know it, you, you isolate yourself and you start thinking crazy thoughts. The what if, what if, what if, why this, why this, what if, why this, why this, why this, why this, why this. Before you know, you're, you're way over here and reality's over here. So you have to choose truth about two things. Number one, you have to choose truth about the reality of the situation. And normally, sometimes you have to get somebody to come alongside of you to help you to think objectively. Because when you're in a funk, you can't see clearly. You got emotional glaucoma. Things are a haze. And so you need somebody to come alongside and help you to see objectively. So that, that's part of it. But, but more importantly, what we have to choose is the truth that is constant. What do you mean by that? We have to choose the truth of the Word of God. Now listen, I just have 30 minutes, and if I don't get done, I, I, need, to, I need to press into this a little bit. Hear me on this. Hear me on this. Hear me on this. Too many Christians use the Bible as a point of reference and not as the context of their lives. Did you hear what I just said? 
They use it as, in other words, they'll, they'll go back to the scriptures when, they, when they're in, in, a, in between a rock, rock and a hard place or their rump is in a sling or something is happening they don't like. Where's that promise? And you go scurry back to the Bible. It's a point of reference. You have to decide, you have to decide, you have to decide that the Bible the Word of God is going to be not just a point of reference, but it's going to be the context of my life. I'm not going to play tag with it. It's going to be the context of my life. It's going to govern my thoughts, govern my actions, govern my responses. And so when I'm discouraged, I have to find out what God has to say about where I am and not how I feel about where I am. In, in Psalm 119, verse 50, the psalmist says, This is my comfort in my affliction, that your promises give me life. This is the voice of God. It's not a collection of inspirational statements, not, not, not an ancient book that's been put together, not fodder for motivational speak. It is, the, it is the voice of the living God. I had a woman in my, come see me in my office and say, I just want to hear God speak. I just want to hear God speak. I want to hear his voice. I, I want to hear his voice. And I slid my Bible across the table and said, read it. She said, what? Yeah, read it out loud. She said, where? Just open up and read it. She read it. I said, you just heard God's voice. This is God's voice. So choose truth. I did not say don't go to other people and get, yeah, you get advice from other folks, but primarily the Bible, the truth, will give you hope. It restore confidence. Make the text your delight. Psalm 119 verse 143 says, trouble and anguish have found me. I'm discouraged. But your commandments are my delight. He said, well, Crawford, I don't, I don't, I don't feel like it's my delight. Well, that's the problem. You choose it to be your delight. You decide for it to be your delight. So the very first thing you have to do when discouragement comes knocking on your door, the first decision you need to make is, okay, 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 I need to choose truth. Truth about the situation, but more importantly, I got I to I I get immersed in this book. And I've got to allow it to speak to my circumstances and to where I am. Secondly, the second choice, and this is really going to hotwire your categories. Uh, you choose truth, but number two, you choose, hear me on this, you choose joy. You go, oh, 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 oh man, how can joy? I, I, joy is just an involuntary response. You're either joyful or you're not joyful. How do I choose joy? Well, therein lies the problem. Remember I said that your emotions are good pass passengers, but they're poor drivers. You, you have to choose joy. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, there's command, and I'm going to drop it. I'm going I'm to give you the command and drop it in its broader context. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. And I want, this, this ought to be curious to you. He commands an emotion. Hmm. Interesting. Huh. Later on, he would, say, he would say, be anxious for nothing. Wait a minute. How can you tell me not to worry? It's a command. How can you tell me to be joy? Well, he, he commands a joy. And I'm, I'm going to unpack this in a second here. But Paul writes this, where he writes this, you know, he, 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 ain't, he ain't down in, you know, uh, in Destin, Florida someplace at a condo overlooking the beach where he writes this. He's in, he's in prison. They're going to kill him. <laughs> you, you hear what I said? He's in prison for trumped up charges. They're going to off him. Look, he's going to be very dead. And yet he's writing them, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. Joy should be defiant. Joy should be defiant. My joy is attached to that which is unaffected. Did you hear what I said? Your joy is attached to that which is unaffected by your circumstances. Your joy is attached to that which is permanent. 
Your joy is attached to that which can never, ever, ever, ever be taken away from you. So Paul is talking about being anchored in that which is true and not being held hostage and being pimped by my circumstances all the time. But lodged in that which is transcendently true that can never be taken from you. And that's the stability that you bring to life. An illustration of this is that, look, let me just say it, try to say it more succinctly. Our joy and rejoicing have to be independent of our circumstances. Our joy and rejoicing have to be independent of our circumstances. I, this is not double speak. Back over when, uh, when Paul and Silas planted the church there at Philippi. And we read these stories, and we, it's, like, it's kind of like we read them in the rose-colored glasses. Oh, it must have been a wonderful time. They worked a little bit and played a little bit. Church got started. Everything's happening. No, no, no. These dudes, Paul and Silas, they got the snot beat out of them. I mean, they, 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 they got beaten. We ain't talking about roughed up a little bit. They got beaten and thrown in jail. We're talking about lacerations. We're talking about, you know, maybe eyes puffy and swollen and bruises and you know, all this other kind of stuff. Now, they could have been sitting over in the corner in jail, you know, what's up with this? And Silas looking at Paul, you mean, why are you getting me in this kind of thing? We're just talking about Jesus and it's supposed to be joy in serving him and we get the, the snot beat out of us and here we are, but it's going to watch what's happening. To How come this always happens to me? <laughs> I'd have been doing that. Yo, dude, I didn't sign up for this. But what were they doing? They were singing hymns and praying. Were they living in some pathetic denial? Absolutely not. They didn't deny their circumstances. They felt the pain. But they knew that they, they knew, they knew that their joy was not dependent upon what was happening to them, but what could never be taken from them. Jesus can't be taken from you. Heaven can't be taken from you. The truth of God's Word can't be taken from you. In fact, your suffering is going to produce good in you. So you choose joy, not because it's on Pollyanna, uh, happy, happy talk, happy speak here, and just make you feel good, Hallmark greeting cards with a Bible verse. No, that's not, that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about the reality, the reality. Your Christianity is not some cultural thing, all right? It's not a gig. It's not a club. It's not a sorority. It's not a fraternity. The living God of the universe is inside of your heart and life, and you've been redeemed forever, and nobody, nobody, nobody can take that from you. So that's why you choose joy, and joy becomes your determination. I'm determined to be joyful. No, I'm not denying my circumstances, but my joy sees through them to the one who's not affected, and he can redeem any given set of circumstances. So you choose truth when discouragement knocks on your door. You choose joy when discouragement knocks on your door. And thirdly, the third choice is that you choose faith. You choose faith. Now, faith, I wrote a book a couple of years ago on, on faith, and one of the hard things about writing this book on faith was that contrary to what we might think, you know, the Bible never comes right out and defines faith. You go, oh, wait a minute, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, now faith is substance. Well, that's a description of faith. It's not a definition of faith. My, my kind of definition of faith that I, that I talked about in this book, Unshaken, my, my definition of faith is putting, putting the teaching of the Scripture together is that faith is God confidence. God confidence. And by the way, parenthetically, faith is not a wish list of keeping God as if he doesn't have something else to do, give him some things. No, no. faith is God confidence. And so when discouragement comes knocking on our door, 
you have to realize that God is not up in heaven sipping Malox over our terrible situation. That he's in charge. And just because you don't know what to do and I don't know what to do doesn't mean God doesn't know what to do. It just simply means I don't know what to do. But I'm not at a loss because the Ancient of Days is still on his throne. He is still in control. And he doesn't have to tell me all that's going on right now, but I, I just need to trust him. And so as Hebrews 11.1 1 says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. I don't know how this is going to work out. But I know that God holds the future. I don't know what's going to happen. But I know that God is in control. And my faith is not in favorable outcomes. Did you hear what I just said? Sometimes y'all need to stop listening to some of these dudes on TV. My faith is not in favorable outcomes. My faith is in the ancient of days. My faith is in a God who loves me and cares about me. My faith is in the one who never changes, who's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And even though I might have to go through some pain, sometimes I got to be cut before I'm cured. Even though I have to go through some pain, even though I have to go through some hassles, and even though I have to go through some disappointments. He's working all things together for good, even though it doesn't feel good. See, we need to get a grown folks Christianity. That's what I'm talking about here. You need to step into a grown folks Christianity where you believe God and you trust Him. But faith is also expressed in our determination, in our desperation. Often God will stand back and not allow things to work out in your life. Now, I'm going to tell you, this, this is not, not, not particularly good news, but God will often stand back and not allow things to work out in your life. He does that in my life. Often He'll drop you into a series of just terrible disappointments one right after another. And I don't care what you, you can, you can kind of claim it away. I don't claim this. I don't claim this. Well, everybody else say, hey, you, you may not claim it, but you're in a mess. All that to create desperation. Now, here's where, here's where Bible words and, and psychology collide because these terms mean two different things. Desperation in the Bible is not, is not hopeless despair. Desperation in the Bible is not hopeless despair. God wants us to be desperate, desperate for Him. Uh, let me give you a quick illustration. What is it? Uh, Luke chapter 8. The woman with the issue of blood, the hemorrhage, and she was in a bad situation. Now, I don't want, it's, it don't want to, it, it's a little gory here, but this woman hemorrhaged for years. Now, knowing Jewish culture at the time, she was untouchable according to the Levitical code because she was bleeding for all those years. She had spent everything that she had, everything, and she couldn't be cured. Obviously, in context, the implication is she's a Jewish woman. She hears that Jesus is coming by. Now, the nuance in the text is this, you know, why, why did she say, so she, so she rushes to Jesus, and he's her only hope. And she said, if I could just touch the fringe, the hem of his garment. Now, here's where the nuance is. Why would, would she say the hem of her garment? I think it's because she did not want to be recognized. She knew that she was violating the law by allowing people to come in contact with her because she was unclean. And I could just see this desperate woman saying, I just, I just, need, to, I just need to come in touch with him. Now, you know, you, you read these stories in this context. This happens in the first year and a half of our Lord's earthly ministry, and there are thousands of people. This is in the time of great popularity. The groupies are all there. He's being inundated. And so the disciples are probably trying to do a little bit of crowd control. 
And everybody's handling, touching Jesus. So I think it's a little bit humorous. You know, this woman touches Jesus, touches the, they didn't come to contact with his skin, just touches the cuff, the hem of his robe. And Jesus stops and says, oh, 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 oh. Who touched me? And Peter's probably going, um. <laughs> you know, there are a lot of people. I don't mean to be smart, but, you know, just kind of like. <clears throat> he just said, no, 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 no. These people handled me. This woman touched me. There's a touch of faith. And maybe your discouragement and the series of things that haven't worked out in your life is to create in you a passion and a hunger to get to Jesus. That's faith. We often turn to God when our foundations are shaking only to discover that it's God who's shaking them. Maybe you got too comfortable. Maybe you were a little bit too reliant on your parents and your siblings at home and predictability there. Maybe you need to turn the corner. Maybe some of you are experiencing homesickness right now, which is real. My grandson's going through that right now, freshman in college at Biola. It's real. Well, maybe that is a positive thing to move you toward greater reliance on the Savior. Because there's always going to be transitions in your life. Ah, I got to hustle on here. So what do you do when discouragement knocks on your door? And you just feel like turning off the lights, pulling the covers over your head, and turning off your cell phone. What do you do? You got to make some decisions and choices. To mire in the funk is going to destroy you. That's not an option. So I got to choose truth, right? I got to choose joy. I got to choose faith. But fourthly, you have to choose community. You have to choose community. Listen, at this stage in my life, and you, you might, this is going to surprise you, um, I speak an awful lot and this kind of thing, but I, I am... I am an introvert, believe it or not. Classic definition of an introvert or an extrovert is where you get your energy from. I don't get my energy from people. I mean, I love people. I'm an introvert that loves people. But actually, when I travel and speak, you don't, have to give me the, you don't have to give me the tour. You don't have to give me the key to the city. You don't have to take me to the sites. You don't have to hold my hand. You don't have to drop me with a button. I'm cool. Just tell me when to speak. Give me a nice clean room with no roaches or bed bugs. I'm cool. And, and you know, a good book to read. I'm, I'm fine. Low maintenance. Okay? I'm cool. But even guys like myself, hear me on this. Listen to me. Nothing ever good happens to anyone who is isolated. Ever. Ever. And for those of us who have bent towards introversion, you got to be very careful. It can be a healthy thing to a point to get back and think through, and, but you need people. Because with isolation comes distortion. With isolation comes distortion. With isolation comes distortion. You start thinking crazy, stupid thoughts that you can't base in reality. They are doing this. They are doing it. Before you know, you got these idiotic conspiracy things going on in your head that's not based in reality. And this is the reason why we need one another. We need healthy community. Galatians chapter uh, 6, verse 2 says, Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Bear each other's burdens. Don't fly solo. Have a group of people always in your life that can speak truth to you. And don't just listen to folks who tell you what you want to hear. Listen to people who can look at you and tell you the truth. Crawford, you ain't all that in a bag of chips. You know, you, what you said the other day, hey, man, I know you feel defensive about it, but that was stupid. 
<laughs> you got to be able to, to hear stuff. You gotta be, somebody needs to be able to get in your grill and tell you, hey, stop pouting. Grown folks, it ain't good for grown folks to pout. You need that. I need it. We need companionship, people who are there who will bear one another's burdens and help us. And we need people to identify with us. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to read this text, but Romans 12, 9 through 16 talks about the body that we're part of, that we need to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. And for those of us who have hyper-independent streaks in our personalities and a little pride and stuff that sets in there, you need to place yourself in a situation where you're with other people and the spotlight is not always on you. You need to learn how to give. We need each other to calibrate us, to bring perspective to us. God gives us the body to put wind in our sails to help us. Don't run from them, run to them. And the fifth and the final decision that we need to make, choice that we need to make, this may sound odd, but when discouragement comes knocking on your door, things not working out, I want to run and hide, I want to get away, I don't like this, what do you do? You choose... <laughs> the opposite of what you would prefer to do. You choose service. You choose service. Now, uh, hear me, by, I want to balance this by saying there, there are times in which you do need to pull back for a little bit, get perspective, uh, think things through, take the walk, maybe even take a couple of days. But in Psalm 126, I love this text here. Psalm 126, verse 4 through 6 says, Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Nagab. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. Now, just a, just a quick word. The Negev there has to do with the desert, the dry places. And the picture there is incredible. You are continuing to sow seeds in a dry place where you don't see response. But you sow those seeds with tears. You keep doing it. You keep serving. You keep showing up. You keep pushing through, even when it's hard. You do the right thing, not the convenient thing. Did you hear what I just said? You do the right thing, not the convenient thing. You just keep doing what's right. You keep serving. I don't feel like serving, but no, you serve. I don't feel I you serve. I'm discouraged. Well, there are other people discouraged too. You just keep moving and you keep serving and your tears become holy fertilizer. And they will produce a bumper crop. So I end with where I started. I don't mean to sound like I have a hard callous heart. But your emotional state to a large degree is a reflection of the choices that you either have made or you refuse to make. What are you deciding to do? Holy Father, thank you for your grace and mercy and your strength. Pray for your power and your love and your encouragement. And Father, we have learned this morning that encouragement is sometimes it's very expensive. It costs us something. But may we pay the price because it's worth it. Live your life in and through us, we pray, and bring incredible joy. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you so much, Dr. Crawford Loritz. It's great to have you. Thanks so much for the challenge and inspiration in your word. Let me remind you of the opportunity to give toward the hurricane relief efforts uh, uh, for the Bahamas. Also, we're going to continue to monitor how the storm affects the East Coast. We're encouraging folks to give through op uh, operationcompassion.org. If you'd like to give something as you leave today, staff members will collect that offering. Also, if you want to drop some things off, including offering, you can do that at the Leonard Center. If you would, please stand with me. And let me remind you that we have U Church on Sunday with Torin Wells. We look forward to having him. If you would, please join me in the college benediction. The words are up on the screen if you're still acclimating yourself to it. Let's pray together. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Have a great day.